Okay, we will begin uh, Thursday, July 7th, City Council Special Work Session. Approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. We have Robin on Zoom. So, hi, Robin. Hi there. <laughs> waiting for Nancy. She'll show up eventually. You just, you just joined up. Just like joined up. Good. Okay, um, we will ask if there's anybody who wants for public comment. Any topic online, in the house, out in the street, whatever. Not seeing anybody, we will move on to our presentation and only topic for the night, our rejuvenation project for the old grade school. Yes, sir. Um, you're all aware that we've had uh, several community outreach events. We had two of them at school, one of them here. Um, the results of that information or those, those meetings was brought to you several weeks ago by CETA. And uh, you, they were asking for direction and essentially you said what you have in there is fine. And so with that, they put together um, the program, which is the step um, before starting schematic design. So tonight is an important night. Your comments are gonna be important. What we hear from everybody um, will be important because this kind of lays the groundwork for where we're, where we're headed. So we have um, Dustin Johnson uh, here to present. Here comes Kelly. I'm gonna try to embarrass him. <laughs> here comes Kelly. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> Mm, yeah, she likes to make an entrance. She did. <laughs> yeah, Kelly. When I do that, Jen calls it making, <laughs> making a, <laughs> making a Kramer. <laughs> so good job. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dustin and Kelly. Great. Uh, thank you again uh, for having us here. Um, still very excited about the project, and uh, just to recap a little bit on where we've been. So. Then this is a, we consider this a two-phase design project. We are in phase one. Phase one uh, consists of a couple of different tasks. The first task is a programming phase. This is our community outreach effort and uh, conversations with all stakeholders, public stakeholder, City of Cannon Beach, the Clatsop Nahalem tribe, uh, and others, and to understand what everyone's high priority objectives and goals are for this project. Um, the next task of this phase is schematic design. So schematic design will be largely informed on the program that is derived from these community outreach events and stakeholder conversations. Tonight wraps up this first task of phase one. Um, and then we'll take this conversation and any modifications that we need to make to the proposed program uh, for this discussion tonight and move into the second task of the first phase, and which is schematic design. <clears throat> Again, uh, just to reiterate, so far in this process, there's not, I won't say there's not been any design, but not much design. And the design that has been done um, has been done in this programming report as a means to convey what we've heard and apply those goals and objectives within the context of the buildings and the site. Um, nothing that's shown graphically tonight is meant to be a finalized space plan or anything like that, or to show final locations of anything. It's just a method used to convey the program to the project. And we'll talk about that as we get more into the graphics. Um, our executive summary uh, that we sent out and is now on the city's website, uh, it's a little long-winded, especially for an executive summary, but we wanted to get uh, a little bit of the background project in there. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that's... No, it's okay. Do you want me to continue, please? Yeah, just go ahead. Um, and I don't think we need to go through all of uh, the, ex the existing summary for the site itself. Uh, but I do want to point out some important things about the site. That is, um, it's zoned for institutional, but it borders um, 
estuary zone, it borders our park management zone, and it borders uh, limited commercial and high density residential. So pretty unique in that aspect. Um, also want to reiterate the uh, tribal significance of this site, <clears throat> that it was moved to the Clats of Nahalem village of Nekus for uh, hundreds of generations. And um, that's something that is going to be kind of the backbone of the program as we talk through this a little bit, making sure that we keep that in the forefront. We, we don't lose context of that. Um, the terrain of the site, uh, we've gone over that a little bit in here. Um, at the point, there was quite a bit of fill added to the site when it was converted for Cannon Beach Elementary, uh, resulted in a larger area for recreation, parking, and such, but it created a unnatural steep transition to the estuary for a large portion of the north frontage with uh, Hill Creek Estuary. Still a nice riparian zone throughout that area, all the way from the north east end of the site to the west end of the site. Um, Kelly and I were out there before this meeting tonight, and we've walked the site several times, and we're still finding unique little pockets of space that is <laughs> we're going to continue to evolve as as designers in this next phase, and, and to think of things that you know would suit the site very well. Um, we do talk a little bit about site access, existing site access, um, being off of Beaver Street as well as off of North Spruce. Uh, both of those would, we would propose to, to maintain those accesses moving forward. Um, and then the parking on the site really right now is limited to the site's frontage with Beaver, with Beaver Street for on-street parking. We've got three paved parking stalls, the southeast corner, and then um, we've got the existing asphalt pad that has been used for a variety of uses in the past. And uh, part of that has been for, for parking and vehicular turnaround currently for patrons of the food bank. Um, the site with its three structures, all three structures were utilized by the Cannon Beach School. Uh, two of those structures, we refer to them as structure one and two initial, initially, um, and then refer to them henceforth as the classroom building as structure one and structure two as the gym building. Uh, both of those are currently vacant. Structure three, which is not within the scope of this project beyond uh, site programming is, is the food bank. That one was also used by Cannon Beach Elementary and is currently used um, by uh, the food pantry. All three have been analyzed by our envelope consultant, our WDI, and found to be in fair to poor condition, but um, able to be rehabilitated. Uh, same thing for mechanical electrical plumbing systems. Uh, separate company, Cezanne, has looked at structures one and two, so the classroom and the gym building, and found that the HVAC unit in both, um, HVAC systems in both, are in need of updating and the electrical service is in need of replacement. Only plumbing fixtures throughout new sprinkler system. Um, there's other site and building assessments that we don't have in our executive summary, but we have included as exhibits. So each one of our consultants, whether looking at the site and its potential for sustainability, <clears throat> the acoustics, tests that were performed uh, in both buildings, uh, additional measures on uh, site design and landscaping, as well as uh, more about the existing HVAC electrical and plumbing systems are all added as exhibits in the back as uh, each one of our consultants own executive summaries for the project. Um, so that's a little bit of the background of the site. Our programming methodology, We'll touch base on this real quick. It's taken about two months to get to where we are today, and it's consisted of multiple community outreach events and discussions with primary stakeholders. We took notes. Uh, we did our uh, various methods of, of showing you graphically and uh, 
via text what we heard coming from the public. No design at all. This is just what we heard. Um, we've got through previously our programming discovery packet and showed you our methodology for to the maximum extent practical, not duplicating the same stakeholders' concerns or interests so as to try to level out the playing field. So if five people talk to the same person and that one person wanted a skate park, that we don't see that represented fivefold by one person. Um, after all of our stakeholder meetings, we had one final stakeholder meeting, and that was with you all, with city council. That was to take our community outreach events to present to you what we heard that the community wanted. We gave you statistical data. We gave you specific sentiment and statements that were made that resonated with us and used you as a sounding board to say, okay, here's what we hear that the community wants. Here's the statistics for it. We broke it down in several ways. How does this meet up with what the city envisions this project being and the city's goals as the primary owner stakeholder? Um, and what we got out of that was a lot of overlap, thankfully, between what the city's goals were and what the public and lots of the Hamlin tribe and, um, and others. Uh, so a lot of overlap and we're gonna see that in tonight's programming. Uh, so if we can just dive into the program for the project. And again, this is, you can think of this document largely as a conduit for what we've heard from the public. And there's no um, benefit to see to, that it, it be represented in any one particular way or weighted toward any one particular thing. This is what we heard. And using the prioritiz prioritization methods that we talked about in the last few meetings, um, Here's how we've divided it up, both in a site context and building context, and devoted different segments to different uh, programs and priorities. So first is the site. Based on community comments and the city's comments, we looked at the site, its existing functions, and we've divided it up into seven primary um, functions. Uh, those functions are talked about briefly here in this in this um, executive summary as the plaza and bus stop. This is the southeast corner of the site, the existing entrance to the site off of First Street. Uh, we talked about a community garden and having that space that activates this site, uh, especially from visitors and, and, and locals coming in off of the bridge off First Street, that there's some life to this site. That's intended to be a year round function um, put on by local gardening enthusiasts. We've got the north patio space. This is a space that is currently paved. It's what remains of what was previously uh, the school's hardscaped play areas as well as parking. It was reduced by about half. And so that half that remains, we are proposing that it remain, that there are a lot of functions that will benefit from having that hardscape, not least of which would be allowing accessible um, accessibility for, for folks with um, mobility challenges. The recreational field, um, that we would maintain that field as it currently exists um, for use for sports and, and typical uh, park use. An amphitheater and fire pit, and this is something that we heard time and time again from multiple stakeholders, we took the liberty of saying that these are two separate functions, the concept of fire on the site and the concept of storytelling and verbal arts, um, but thought that the two could potentially be represented in the same space in an artful, meaningful way, and perhaps enhance the function of each other. The riparian corridor that we talked a little bit about, this is the space in between at Hughes Park in the estuary, um, that either where the bank was altered or where it is still natural, but contains um, mature vegetation and is an area for birds and other wildlife. Um, we, of course, would 
our recommendation is to, to maintain that and to um, add native plantings to that, but to largely leave that uh, area unaffected by any significant um, disturbance. And then the estuary beach. And again, we're not really in, the only changes we're recommending to the estuary beach is access to it. And what can we do to enhance uh, access to the beach from neck use by people with kayaks and canoes um, and increasing the accessibility for the, the couple of uh, uh, pedestrian access points to the beach, just with some improved maintenance. So we've taken these concepts on the site plan and maybe what we'll do is kind of break from uh, the executive summary and go to that first site exhibit. So we can show you graphically these areas that we're we're talking about. That one? So this one here, yeah. So the the dark patches on there are obviously the buildings on the site. Um, I do want to emphasize that we in this exhibit, we're not just looking at the site itself as defined by property lines, but we're also looking at adjacent city-owned properties as well, because we do see some potential to start connecting some of these city-owned properties. Um, we've got the city-owned park to the north. We've got uh, Ecola Park to the east. We've got city-owned property with beach access to the west that we can start to connect these and create a bigger picture project, whether now or in the future, that would be uh, an even greater asset to the Cannon Beach community. Um, on the lower right-hand corner there in the southeast corner of the site, you see pale yellow. That's what we're referring to as the plaza. The plaza space, we have a little description on there for each of these seven spaces. And I can probably makes sense to just read you the descriptions that we have on there. So the plaza is an outdoor introduction to the site and point of arrival. Uh, it's envisioned to speak to the tribal heritage of the site as the participant progresses to the welcome center. Amenities this space include bicycle racks, planners and benches, a reader board indicating upcoming events, um, as well as tribal sculptures and art and education uh, and a drop-off area and for uh, shuttles and buses potentially covered. There's one term in here that's already started to cause a little bit of confusion with some feedback that we're getting uh, from the public. And that is the mention in, in here of a um, welcome center. And we'll talk about this a little bit more as we get into the buildings, but I want to clarify just right now that the Welcome Center is not intended to duplicate the Welcome Center that currently exists in Cannon Beach. This is a Welcome Center to the site so that when people come to this site, they are educated as they enter off the street through the building into Neckus Park in the North Patio, that they, that they get educated on what was there, what is the significance, the tribal significance, the ecological significance, um, the geographic significance, so that there is a, a a learning of this site and hopefully enhances people's experience of this site for whatever purpose they're there for. Uh, the next one, the community garden that's shown in kind of a bluish green to the north of the plaza. Um, this is a year-round garden meant to activate the site with local gardening enthusiasts. The garden is envisioned to enhance the cooking function and food bank function of the site in warmer months with fresh herbs, vegetables, and fruits. We'll talk about that cooking function as we go through the buildings. Uh, the North Patio. Uh, this is the existing paved area that can be resurfaced or replaced with a different hardscape material. Uh, it can serve a large variety of uses for public and private functions, outdoor exhibits, and events. It's large enough to be fitted with a portable pavilion for covered outdoor tables and chairs or for covered outdoor functions. This, we added in there ourselves, this could be considered part of a little bit of programming design we did do. And it's a function of what we've seen during COVID and that a lot more public and private agencies um, and, and groups are wanting to have covered outdoor space as opposed to just outdoor space um, without covered. 
Um, it will continue to be used for vehicle turnaround for the food bank, as well as a staging and drop-off area for exhibitions and events. It's envisioned to be an ADA compliant space for those with mobility challenges who wish to experience the site. Um, the next space, the recreation field, the big uh, green area shown on the map up there, continued use as it is right now. It would also continue to uh, be proposed to, to hold functions either uh, in collaboration with the North Patio or by itself for farmer's market, for outdoor exhibition, um, and also recreation. The amphitheater and fire pit envisioned to be a small outdoor venue for performing and spoken arts and storytelling. The space is envisioned to have a fire pit at its center with a detachable grilling grate that can be used for bonfires or for cooking. Um, the fire pit may support the storytelling and spoken arts function of the space. And the riparian corridor, a travel corridor and habitat for various wildlife species. And excuse me, but this is the, the pink areas we're seeing border the site from east to west. Um, it's, it's envisioned to be enhanced with na native plantings. No significant modifications to this area are expected or envisioned. Um, it's got potential to serve as a connecting fabric between Neckies Park um, to Les Shirley Park to the north via a footbridge. And again, these are just potential high-level concepts. Um, to Ecola Creek Park to the east with enhanced pedestrian circulation, um, for example, we currently don't have a public sidewalk that extends from E. Cola Park just to the east of the site to um, the entrance to Nike's Park. Um, Dustin, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. You're referring to E. Cola Park. Is it the one um, with the bandstand? Or what do you talk about as E. Cola Park? It's directly east of where we're showing the community garden on the other side of First Street. Right here. Yep. Okay, right. So the public sidewalk stops at where that southern crosswalk is, directly east of the plaza, and does not continue on up north. Yeah. Um, so right now, there's just a, a detachment between the two right. that can be easily resolved. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, another way those two spaces could be attached is with the nature trail that's on Neckies Park that runs along the north border. And having that continue onto E. Cola Park and connecting up with the E. Cola Nature Trail a little bit further to the south. And then the estuary beach. Um, and this is not just the part of the beach, again, that's defined by the property lines of this site. But again, this continues on to city owned property um, with great beach access further south. Uh, general beach use, including wading and swimming, picnics, beach combing, beach sports, and wildlife viewing. Uh, debris pickup is envisioned for this area to enhance its usability. There's a lot of driftwood and uh, down materials that we picked up to, to make it a little more usable. We were out there today. Um, the city was just a buzz today. <laughs> it was it was really cool to see. I mean, we've we've been here in the spring. We've been here you know, on average every week or every two weeks since. And today was a real good sense of, of how not just the site itself, but the city of Cannon Beach can really just be activated almost overnight. Um, and we saw that at the Estuary Beach today, there was volleyball going on, the uh, different birds doing crazy bird things. <laughs> Um, it, it was just, it was very active out there and we had not seen that specifically on the estuary yet uh, until today. Uh, so that's the site programming again, high level stuff. And I just want to reiterate, we're showing general areas, general sizes, nothing is intended to be set in stone. The community garden there in the light blue is generally approximately the area of where we had envisioned it based on what we heard from the community, from city council. Is that the size it needs to be? Is that the shape it needs to be? Probably not. And that's all the kind of stuff that's gonna get ironed out in schematic design. Same thing can be said for the amphitheater and fire pit. Are those one space? Are they separate spaces? Are they located where we have it? There's methodology to where we have it located, but it is certainly not set in stone. And we'll continue to iron those kinds of things out. Um, 
We'll head back up into the executive summary real quick and talk about the building programming. So for the building programming and for the site, we talked about this a little bit last time, there's not a single program out there that's gonna serve the needs of all stakeholders meeting all of their goals, addressing all of their concerns. So part of what we're doing with this programming report is striking a balance. We also have to do that with budget. So as we review the, pro the proposed program for the buildings, a couple of things are key. One is that flexibility is at the heart of all the decisions that were made and how we show the potential for these buildings to be used moving forward. Uh, but also in considering budget, we're going to show you two levels of, of scope that could be um, conducted in these buildings. One of them we call the baseline scope and another one we call baseline plus, which is everything in the baseline scope with additional okay. uh, scope of work attributed to it that could further meet uh, the needs and address the concerns of primary stakeholders that we heard throughout the programming process. So structure one, the classroom building. Again, based on feedback from the public and uh, from the class of the Hamlin tribe, from the city, and from the visitors that we talked to, there's a large interest in seeing this space continue to be used for education, uh, be it classrooms, be it meeting rooms, be it workspaces, shop spaces, um, and also for exhibition spaces that uh, for exhibits that don't need a, a very large space like the gym, but still need to be indoors. Um, flexibility. So part of what we did for this building was to show you typical layouts for two types of spaces within this building. When I say types of spaces, really just sizes of spaces. So one thing that we're recommending for the classroom building is we have four existing classrooms in there. Each one's a little less than a thousand square feet. So what if we take two of those classrooms, demolish a wall, a hard wall between those two and partition or other temporary optional partition to be used as needed. So we now have two different types of spaces. One is a thousand square foot classroom space. The other could be used to double that space or as an option, could also be cut off with that temporary partition. Um, and we can go ahead and look at those real quick, Rusty, if that's all right. Okay. Not that one. Uh, if we keep going down to the typicals, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Can you scroll up? Next one up. So this is the baseline scope for that building, the lower left hand side. The baseline scope for both buildings is shown on this exhibit, but I think we'll talk about the classroom building first and then um, go back up to the executive summary review the gym building and come back down. So for this one, what you're seeing on the left there, those green spaces, that is the educational flex or flexible space. Those are the spaces that can be used for classrooms, meeting rooms, workshops, um, exhibition space, and other gathering spaces that would benefit from a open layout concept. You're seeing three bubbles there. Uh, two of them are the single classrooms, the one in the middle we're showing as a double classroom with a dashed partition in between. For the purpose of this exhibit, we're showing that those two center classrooms are the ones being combined into an optional double-sized classroom. Um, as we get through this and schematic design, that is would likely shift. It probably would not remain the two center classrooms. So I don't want to get too far into the weeds with design. The intent here is just to show you that we can easily, even though it's a load bearing wall, we can take out a large portion of that wall in between two classrooms, replace it with strong backing and add a um, temporary wall, optional wall in there like a folding partition. So if we scroll down, Rusty, we'll see, we'll start to see what we call typical layouts. And this is to show, here we go. This is the first, how one space can be used to to serve multiple functions and what those layouts might start to look at, look like. So this first one is 
for classroom space. So in a single classroom here, what we're showing is that we can accommodate easily 36 students. Um, we're showing optional locations in there for audio and video. Uh, we do show that we would recommend in each of these spaces still having a sink, still having some cabinetry, that there's going to need to be some storage space in each of these rooms uh, and access to plumbing fixtures. Um, on the right hand side in the double classroom, we go from being able to see 36 to being able to see 96. So even though it's only twice the amount of space, you start to see an economy of scale where we can accommodate more than twice as many people. What's not shown on these, and again, this would be something that we'll consider in schematic design, is do we access these spaces individually from the exterior of the building, or do we need to dedicate part of that interior space for um, a corridor that runs along one wall or the other? Uh, the next one down is what this can start to look like as um, a workspace. So. Uh, one thing we heard about a lot was a, a space that could be used for crafts for various purposes. Uh, one of them that sticks out in my mind is with the class of Nehalem tribe and a space to be able to teach folks the traditional ways to do various types of class of Nehalem crafts, um, including carrying dug fir bark and weaving the bark a year later into um, beautiful uh totes and pots. Uh, the next space down below that, or the next function of the same spaces would be as meeting rooms. And again, th this is something that you can lay it out as a meeting room in any number of ways, but this is to give you some idea of scale and a way in which it can be laid out as a single room or a double room. So the single room we're showing can accommodate uh, 26 chairs in a round table format. Uh, and then over in the double, we're looking at uh, 68 with room for a stage. Again, there's going to be some push and pull on where does it make sense to put audio and video? How many in each space? Do we treat the spaces the same? Maybe some are dedicated uh, towards audio visual, visual type functions and, and some not. Maybe we don't have video in every single classroom. But again, that's something we will figure out in schematic design. And then the last one. Rusty, there you go, is, is exhibition space. Exhibition space needs big room with nothing in the way and the ability to set it up based on whatever it is you're exhibiting. So in the double classroom here, we're showing the beautiful handcrafted 32 foot dragonfly canoe, um, how that could be center stage in that double room with maybe other type of museum pieces that represent the Clatsman Halo tribe specific to that village, perhaps uh, set up in that 2000 square foot space. Over on the left side there, we see exhibition space and how that might be set up for just a single classroom. Again, in some cases, the, what we're showing right here is exhibit cases with specific sizes. It all depends on what is it that is being exhibited. Does it need exhibit cases? Does it stand on its own? Um, so this is just intended to show one way that it could be set up to support this particular function. In the, can we scroll up to the next diagram, color diagram to the top? Uh, one, one more. Oh, nope, that's the one. The other thing, um, we looked at the, sorry, Rusty, I think it's actually next one down. There you go. This is what we're calling the baseline plus for the classroom building. Um, the things that we would be proposing at additional budget and those things that are beyond baseline and how we're defining baseline is the scope that is required to bring these buildings up to code from a life safety standpoint, from a structural standpoint, and from an energy standpoint, but also to make the, the minimum amount of upgrades needed to support the intended function. And those could be outside of simply meeting code requirements. So the baseline plus then starts to look at additional features that we could add for additional cost. And depending on where we are 
with, with budget and how we're trending. So with the baseline plus, what we're showing here, again, as a high priority, would be to start to open up that north side of the classroom towards Neckuse Park and the estuary uh, with additional storefront windows. Doing this is uh, gonna require a little bit of structural enhancement on the south facade. That south facade, as you know, is currently pretty much ribbon windows all the way across, and that will need to be addressed. That's part of the baseline scope. Um, that we would do a seismic retrofit in that building to meet current code. Uh, and then if we were to open up on this side in the baseline to views towards the north, we would be looking at probably doing a little bit more to be able to accommodate that. Uh, we're also showing uh, enhanced exterior materials and architectural features. That, sky's the limit when it comes to that kind of thing. So how much budget do we have to really start to address the exterior aesthetics of the building? That is not something that is needed to support the function of the buildings to get the bump and running for their intended purpose. But it's something that we certainly saw was a high priority amongst all stakeholders. Um, and then upgrading the roof structure to accommodate solar panels. Uh, one thing I didn't talk in any real depth about was the, the potential on the site for uh, some sustainability practices. One of those, and our WDI, our consultant, um, had done a full uh, in, uh, sustainability study and, and what types of sustainability measures does this site lend itself to. One of those is photovoltaic cells or on-site renewable energy. The challenge there is that we have this existing roof with a certain amount of capacity um, to be adding additional load to. And to be able to accommodate solar panels on that existing roof, we can only load it to about 25% of coverage. So about 25% of the area of the roof could be covered with solar panels before we start looking at upgrading that structure with additional joists so that we can get more solar panels up there and get more use out of that solar function. Dustin, does putting, uh, taking out the wall in the middle between the two rooms, does that reduce that 25% or is are we able to engineer that enough to? No, it doesn't because we have to go in there um, just to be able to make that opening meet code. We have to add the steel strong backing, additional footing on either side of that opening that the gravity load that we're talking about of uh, being able to accommodate the extra weight of the solar panels yeah. is not a, a driving function behind like the footing size. It's going to be more laterally um, driven. The other, the other thing I was, when you were talking about 25%, that's five, 4,000 plus. So you're looking at still at around a thousand square feet. That's 10, that's a hundred, 10 by 10 panels. <laughs> That's a lot. It's not insignificant. It's not insignificant. Now we do have um, 12,000 square feet of, of building potentially to, to power at once. And some of those functions uh, that require high level audio, video, um, heating and cooling all going at the same time will be uh, pretty demanding on electricity. So something to consider there as well. And the other thing I, I thought of off the top of my head is a separate structure We're hanging off or supported on the walls and not really hanging on the roof at all. So good. I'm just. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing we do talk about in here is that because we're so limited on area, um, we talk about the, that there's always the possibility of putting it on the ground, but when you start to do that and to make them really viable, they have to be located out of the shade where they get full sun there's really not a way to do that without taking up space that could be used for some other necessary function like recreation or um, amphitheater and fire pit. Um, but we do talk out in there about the benefit of having covered outdoor areas, especially on that hardscape. And one thing that really appeals to the design team, and we're starting to delve into a little bit of a design discussion here. And, but one thing that is important to me, as I hear about, you know, how much of a priority sustainability is amongst all stakeholders, is not only to add sustainability um, uh, 
functions or practices to the site, but to really make them visible and part of the experience. So one thing we can do um, if we were to do these outdoor pavilions is to use the solar panels as roofs and you experience the shade that you get from that is the shade from each of the PV cells. Uh, and you really, it, we'll, we'll show you images of what that looks like um, in schematic design and see if that's something worth exploring. But it's an idea that's, we're kind of floating in our minds right now. And Dustin, I think that we had a conversation that the structure of the gym um, is kind of maxed by its nature. Yeah, so the, the gym is an incredibly unique structure. It acts as a, as a shell structure because there's no primary structural members in there. When I first walked into that building, I was assuming I was going to see big arched glue lamps. And then across, you know, from these big glue lamp beams, we were going to have joists. We don't have that. We've got two by eight full height ribs every 24 inches on center that create that, that shell. So to me, current code, that anytime we want to, any improvement we want to do that would result in opening up a wall or, or the roof at any point along that curved roof surface, roof wall surface, anything beyond two feet that results in cutting of one of those two by eight ribs, that has to be fixed. We can't just leave it that way. We have to then go in on either side of that opening with additional full height ribs to replace the one that we cut. Right, but also when I think we were talking about things that might be hung or um, if you try to put solar cells on top, that it's the, the structure is not meant for that. It's not meant for that. It's certainly not meant for PV cells. It's, yeah. it's curves are perpendicular to how we would want them to be, to be effective yeah. for this latitude. We want them to be south facing and at a, a particular angle. And the reason I brought that up is that that would be a great place if we could use all that rough space to, uh, to deal with it. But um, and the structural engineers are saying not without a whole bunch of additional work. Yeah. So what kind of additional money? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. The good news about a structure like that is the end walls, the two flat walls, they're fair game. So as we look at improvements aesthetically or daylighting or whatever it is to that building, mm -hmm. those end walls really can come into play and yeah. we can do a lot with those. Thank you. But, um, and then, so for programming for the uh, gym building, if we can go back up to the executive summary. So again, flexibility is at the heart of this building as well. And that's uh, intended to meet the versatile functions that we heard as high priority interests from all the stakeholders. Um, we have a big open space currently in there and that's excellent for being able to accommodate a variety of large gathering spaces. Um, so for our baseline recommendations in there, and. and in this report, we call it as event flex space as opposed to classroom flex space. So classroom flex space was for the classroom building. This is event flex space, can hold anything from indoor exhibitions to galas and fundraisers to performing arts performances. Um, really, uh, sky's the limit there, again. Um, with this one, if we can go down to the baseline, building bubble diagram once more. So this current building is approximately 7,000 square feet, and that does not include the 964 square foot mezzanine. Uh, the mezzanine in that space, unfortunately, the roof levels, the ceiling levels, uh, which are also the floor levels, are created with um, the structure that holds up those ceilings in the floor. And those, unfortunately, are at different levels. So to be able to accommodate that for public use, we'd have to make it ADA accessible with ramps, um, ADA accessible stairs, and it doesn't work real great for that. But something we need a lot of with FlexSpace is storage. Uh, to be able to quickly set up the space 
as different functions, some of those uh, tables and chairs, for example, are going to need to be stored on site. And that's one thing that this baseline option of keeping the existing mezzanine in there provides is a lot of storage space. We can still use those upstairs spaces in the mezzanine for things like back of house, audio, video control, utility and mechanical spaces. But as far as access to the public, it would um, be at a very great expense to be able to do that. So we are not recommending use of it by the public in this baseline option. Uh, down below the mezzanine, uh, but within the mezzanine footprint, we'd be recommending um, storage space down there. This is for heavier objects, tables and chairs, and any other uh, audio visual, um, really to get the, to the space set up in any meaningful way for a particular function. The majority of your storage is gonna be on the first level where you're not having to go up and down stairs. We have quite a bit more storage space in this baseline function because of that existing mezzanine than we do in the enhanced um, the baseline, what we're calling the baseline plus. And uh, we'll talk about that here in a minute. We are recommending uh, something that we heard a lot of by most community, uh, but by most stakeholders that we spoke with during programming was the need for a cooking function on site. So in the baseline program, what we're recommending is a catering kitchen that could be equipped to also function as a teaching kitchen. Catering kitchen would be set up so that vendors could bring in pre-cooked meals and heat them up prior to serving. Um, but if equipped with uh, equipment, such as uh, induction cooktops, portable, that could be stored, it could be used as a teaching kitchen to support the food bank function um, and other groups as well with the need for um, cooking courses. So this, <clears throat> go through the baseline scope real quick as we have it on our diagram here. So again, seismic improvements. Some of those seismic improvements are being done uh, today, actually. We were in there. They're getting some of the, anything that can be done um, seismically that was designed by ZCS engineers that can be done from beneath the roof is being done at this time. Seismic improvements that will be done from the exterior and at the roof level will be deferred to spring of next year when they can be done while also accommodating the design that we come up with uh, between now and then. Um, new sprinkler system throughout, new HVAC, HVAC system throughout, new lighting, new audio and video equipment. Uh, we're going to have new insulation as part of the re-roof. That would also entail new insulation at the end walls. Um, other energy upgrades to meet current energy code. And then uh, the exterior cladding on that building, the existing cedar shape of various sizes is, uh, is observed to be at end of life. So even at the baseline scope of work, we're recommending that it be recited. And we're not saying that it should be recited with the same material, just that it needs to be recited. Uh, and then minimal acoustics upgrades. One thing you'll note when you look at the acoustic report that RWDI did inside that particular space is that it lends itself to choir and music and not so much towards uh, individual uh, speaking. So, <laughs> Somebody up at a stage giving a speech, whether in the middle or at either end, is, is not an optimal use of the current acoustics of that space. And, you, you know, we can make that space function acoustically for, for any number of ways, but for varying amounts of additional budget. So if it, you know, under this one, it lends itself just by its shape and its existing materials, it would lend itself very well towards choir and uh, and music performing arts. So for our baseline program, we would say, let's enhance the acoustics in that space to serve that function primarily. For baseline, we would look at maybe some additional acoustic enhancements to be able to um, accommodate the spoken arts. Um, if we can then scroll on down to the baseline plus. So again, 
as with the classroom building, in this one, we are showing opening up that north wall to views to the estuary and park. To do this, it means eliminating entirely that existing as an aim. That takes away a lot of our storage space, pretty much all of our storage space. So kind of in combination with the need for that additional storage space, what we're showing is enlarging the, uh, what would have been a catering kitchen, or excuse me, um, yeah, the catering kitchen to a full commercial kitchen that's gonna require a larger footprint. But if we were to do that, we would wanna frame the roof, the ceiling of that to be uh, a floor for storage space above and then provided with an equipment lift for efficient loading and unloading to set up the space as needed. So in this baseline plus option, your storage is, is coming from the advantage of having such a tall 30 foot space. You don't need a 30 foot kitchen. So we can put that space on top of the kitchen provided we get reasonable access for tables and chairs and other potentially fairly heavy equipment that would be too much of an encumbrance to carry up and downstairs. Uh, additional baseline plus features of this um, classroom building. Additional AV features, we talked about uh, additional accent materials and architectural features for the classroom building. That'd be the same for um, the, the gym building. When we talked to people throughout the programming process, there was a lot of concern about the existing gym kind of being an eyesore as you come in off the, the first street bridge. So we certainly got the sense that between the two structures, the priority to, to aesthetically update one versus the other was with the gym. Um, yeah, and, and that's along with the uh, commercial kitchen and the storage upstairs, the mezzanine lift, uh, we need additional uh, stairs for egress, but we're also recommending, if determined to be required by the city's uh, management of the facility, that we have a, a facilities office above that kitchen as well. That's the decision to open up that north end or CGM to a lot of other things like you're going to have to move storage. The only place you can find it is you've already planned on a Catering kitchen, you would expand that but storage over that. So we're basically moving all the storage capacity from the north end to the south end so we can open up the north end. At, at a much greater expense, but something everybody seems to want. It is a very common high priority amongst all of the stakeholders that we talk to. Okay. Dustin, we're in, in um, base. Where is the chair and table storage for the classrooms? We have that beneath the mezzanine, what used to be the, the cafeteria. We also have that existing addition that, Rusty, correct me if I'm wrong, but it used to, yeah, there was a kitchen in there and a lounge in there. That was added on at some point after the original barrel vault was constructed. That is also available to use as storage. We show that as being removed in the baseline plus option. I don't know that that's necessarily the right call because it is existing space that can be used for storage in either the baseline or the baseline plus if it doesn't get removed. So, but that storage would be for both buildings. Correct. Yep, correct. And you're all in our table yep. and chairs. And that, that brings up a good point. So we talked about the, the baseline plus features of the classroom building and the baseline plus features of the, the gym building. But one of the baseline plus features that we'd be recommending as a high priority uh, would be to expand what we're calling the welcome center in the classroom building east to attach to the gym building so that it can function as the same. So for the public or anyone to get from outside from the plaza into either the classroom building or uh, the gym building that they would have to go through the welcome center 
again, being educated along the way about the significance of the site culturally, um, ecologically, geographically, and then from there um, to either the classroom building or the... Uh, um, an implied requirement that um, the Welcome Center would need to be staffed all the time? Is there what kind of requirement? Like, well, the require, does it, if you had a chance to think through, because the way that it looks there, everybody would go through and so you'd want to have some sort of a, a gatekeeper function. So is that, it, would that be something that would be closed off and you could just walk through if we open the door or is it open all the way across? Would we require somebody to be there? Have you not gotten to that? We've thought about it at a conceptual level and you know, this is, I don't know that anyone who's really looked at this is, is going to say that we don't recommend having a facility manager on site when the building is operated. Well, not necessarily a facility manager, but just a staff member working for the facility manager. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't want to tie a facility manager to that location. Yeah, so, you know, with something like this, we, we see this Welcome Center as basically a museum exhibition, exhibition space that is intended to educate people primarily on the cultural heritage aspects of the site. So we envision this being a lot of classic Nehalem art and history and educational tools, maybe some ways to experience the site, how it once was, um, all that happening here. To be able to do that without it being staffed could be a challenge. Okay. Yeah, and there's several bubble. Um, it, tends to become an entry lobby. And I think that might be a, that's gonna be a challenge to work that out. Um, go ahead. In May Bull I Robin. ask a question? Hi Robin, sure. Hello, okay, so <laughs> um, Dustin, I had a question when we're talking about um, the improvements or the baseline plus feature for the north side of the gym, have you considered if you put a glass piece there, how that would affect the acoustics? Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And to answer that simply no, because at this point in the game, all we've done acoustically is to go in there and test that space for what it naturally uh, wants to uh, support in terms of acoustic type functions. As we get RWDI into schematic design, as we look at these different options of what we can do with the space, including adding this glass wall on the north end, they will be recommending ways to mitigate that acoustically. Okay. And then I was curious, are you considering at all because there would be so uh, much up and down over the commercial kitchen to put an elevator um, or a dumbwaiter of some kind to help um, get the chairs up and down. That sounds like such a daily uh, project. It, you know, it really would be. So what, what we're showing for vertical conveyance there is uh, equipment lift, uh, which is basically a, a large dumbwaiter Okay. Uh, not as expensive as a uh, elevator per se, mm -hmm. um, but a mechanical means to get heavy equipment up and down without having to carry it up the stairs. That's great because I've done catering and I'll tell you, <laughs> exactly. you're pretty tired at the end of a day and <laughs> not accidents or anything like that happening. Yeah. You know, there's there's various sizes of these equipment lifts and in and various capacities of how much can you load them for a single trip and how quick do they run? Are they hydraulic? Are they lever arms? Um, all kinds of options, and we can really start as we define what this kitchen function is and what the storage needs of the facility is going to be for these various functions. Um, what type of product we'd be looking at to best meet the current needs. Jennifer looks like she has her hand up. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try to do it without my dogs barking. I apologize if they do. Um, <laughs> a couple of things that I was thinking of to Bruce's comment, I think that the, you know, this expanded entryway, we can make it so that it could be open um, at times or closed at times so that the 
you know, they don't have to necessarily, to access the site, you don't have to go through an exist, a building that's locked down to make sure that you're not requiring a staff member to be there. I think that's something, sorry, that could happen. And then I, I think storage, um, as we get into the to actual schematic, you know, each of the rooms are going to require storage. Each, there's going to be a lot of storage discussions happening. So um, we can, we will make sure that we address storage in each space just to make sure that it works functionally for each of the planned out activities. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, so for, we show in the typical layouts for the classrooms, and again, they're just conceptual at this point, but storage in those rooms would be uh, handled with cabinetry with additional storage needs being um, uh, supported by the, the storage available in the gym building. Uh, and the last sort of programmatic thing I wanna mention about the, the gym space is what happens to that space when it's not in use. And that was one of the main reasons why we had that follow-up meeting with the county after we talked to you know all the stakeholders in the community outreach. What happens when this building is not being used for scheduled events? Who is it open to? What function does it serve? And based on that discussion and uh, the intense interest by the public stakeholders that there needs to be space for recreation, uh, especially for kids in, in, the, in the winter months, that the space be open to the public when not in scheduled use and used for recreational purposes, such as basketball, pickleball, walking track, volleyball, um, and other functions as you start to use this space. And, and I think there's gonna be some programmatical needs that begin to be discovered as the space gets used more and more. Um, and as long as we have storage to support those needs, climbing walls, um, you name it, we can be able to transform that space to meet the current recreational needs um, of the community. The one thing we would do for that space, um, right now it's got a concrete floor in there, not ideal for most sports. So we'd be looking at putting a sports floor of sorts in there and we'll talk through options during schematic design, but then striping that floor for a variety of these different uses. And there's different ways to do it. There's no one best way to do it. it depends on what sports you're looking to try to accommodate, how many pickleball courts? Is it a full-size basketball court? Are we just looking you know, to extend a, a three-point ring outside of each of the hoops? But we'll show you different layouts for what that could look like, and it'll start to uh, represent the, the type of sports and recreation functions that could be accommodated at any given time. Uh, so that's really it for our presentation. Um, I want to reiterate that Largely, this program that we've done for this project is just a conduit for what we've heard amongst all stakeholders. And again, there's not a single program out there that's going to address all concerns and meet everyone's interests and goals, but to the maximum ability possible and via the means that we've talked about for controlling the information that we're getting and prioritizing the information that we're getting from each stakeholder. Um, that we, we feel comfortable that this program represents uh, the interests of the majority of each of the stakeholders that we've talked to. Dustin, to your last point, um, are you, it, it looks to me like you accommodate everything one way or the other. Are you aware of a function? Like, did somebody want to have, um, I, I, I don't know, uh, curling in the gym? Um, is, is there anything like that that is a result of what you put together that you are aware has been eliminated? I think you're catching everything. Uh, th there's a little bit of everything in here. There are some things. Um, when we had our discussions with um, the class of Nahalem tribe, there was an interest for having fire represented in the, uh, the, the gym building. Yeah. We run into just too many code issues with that to really be able to do that and to maintain the versatility of that structure for other functions. So for the purpose of the programming document, that's an example of one thing that 
we found could not easily be accommodated and therefore isn't represented in here. Um, a skate park, an indoor skate park, another thing that, mm -hmm. yeah, could we have um, some small-ish, maybe there's a, a half pipe that can be accommodated and broke down into different pieces and then stored in the available storage, but that it's a pretty difficult one yeah. to, to, to really try to accommodate. Um, and again, we, you know, there were some proponents of a skate park inside that building, but we, we, like, we tended to hear from the same people over and over again. So that was one of the, one of those items that we had to make sure that we were controlling pickle information ball. coming in. It's the pickleball effect. How many people are actually representing that particular interest? And so, because it was relatively few and a difficult thing to accommodate, that would be another example of one that didn't make it as a as an interest or priority that's being accommodated with this program. But it does look like we're trying to accommodate some sort of a fire location on the um, on the site. Yes, and um, I don't I, I I agree with you that there's a couple of those things that are like sports related that are just going to be too much. When you said climbing wall, I think we got a good location for it, but I would want that to be monitored all the time. You know, safety harnesses, all that kind of stuff. And that's just going to tie somebody up. Yeah. Um, and I think the only wall you could do that on would be the north wall. And uh, I don't want to see that blocked by a thing. So anyway, I'm just saying, that I think you really did a good job. Um, most of the things I can think of are accommodated one way or another in there. It's just how are we going to do it? How are we going to manage time and those kind of things? Jennifer wants to make a comment. Yeah, I was going to say if one of the things that I think that the, that there's two schools of thought when you look at the site and from a programming standpoint is parking versus lesser parking. So you know, demo the buildings and put parking versus um, have limited parking. I think that was one that you know you're not accommodating both sides of or all all sides on that. Mm -hmm. Another good example. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, I was wondering. I, I noticed in the plus that the gym flex base is six thousand square feet, and the base only I don't know forty seven hundred or something like that, uh, forty eight hundred square feet. Um, and I know that comes from getting rid of the, the mezzanine. Um, Struggling with why you enlarge the south end mezzanine and, and depth for storage in the kitchen. Have you thought about when you everybody wants to open up the north end for light and visibility? Nobody's 30 feet tall, so they don't need it opened all the way up. So I wonder if they hadn't looked at a mezzanine across the south, the, the north side, with the lower part open with lots of glass. That may, by a way, that helps with the acoustic issue as well. And then with the uh, equipment lift, use that space that can still be blocked in the mezzanine for additional storage. It just, I think, I don't know if people are envisioning this, this huge arch, all open glass. I think the impact you're looking for is from inside, you want to be able to see the green looking out. Therefore, I think there's a possibility to utilize a mezzanine on that north end and, and keep below the mezzanine open to lock the glass. But just, uh, Absolutely. Yep. And that's certainly an option to look at. And as we start to lay out, you know, what, what level of sports do we want to be able to accommodate in there? Um, if we start to close off both ends of the building at that second story height, we do start to cut into that higher volume space in there. Um, so can we still do that and accommodate volleyball? Can we still do that and accommodate basketball to the level that we want basketball represented in the space. We'll start to look at things like that. Um, does it make sense, you know, if we need more storage before adding a, a storage mezzanine, another one onto the north end and 
each of these mezzanines is going to have to have a lift. And that's something to consider too, is that you don't want to be walking up and down these stairs with heavy equipment. So if you have two isolated mezzanines used for storage purposes, that's two lifts. So it doesn't make sense at that point to look at keeping what we're showing is being removed in the baseline option, but that kitchen and lounge addition mm -hmm. um, and dressing that up a little bit and keeping it as stored space. Okay. I was kind of thinking the same thing what Mike just mentioned is uh, working with what we have compared to the demo and building the plus aspect to the south um, cost-wise. Because that seems to be one of the more dramatic costs after we've done all of the mechanicals. Um, and I think it's something we really need to um, have several options to see, I guess. Um, as is, as is modified, both ends, one end, you know, south end kind of thing. Because um, I see a lot of variables there. And I'm also looking at the fact that the east bump out on the building is essentially the same size as you've presented for the catering kitchen. So I'm just looking at one bubble to the other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so if you got a space that's already there. The other concern that I'm starting to look at for the south end kitchen location is the uh, mechanicals on that. Where are you gonna vent it out? Is that gonna go through the roof? That becomes that structural problem going through that roof specifically. I suppose you could go out the wall, but then you got all this stuff outside. That's Yeah, I think if we were to propose uh, in schematic design that the kitchen be on that south end that we would go through the roof. Yeah. Um, and we can do it in a way where we've got the exhaust fan located at the mezzanine level and we're just taking a duct up through the roof and just supporting that duct laterally as it penetrates the roof and we can likely do that without penetrating any of the ribs so probably not a too much of a structural concern there if we go straight up but i, I agree with you i don't think we want to have mechanical ducting that is penetrating the main frontage facade of that building Another, yeah. I know we're getting into the weeds here, but if, if you get that bump out area following what Sam said, have that be the catering kitchen. I could see the welcome center, the entrance being the south end of the gym building. And you could still then put storage above that as a mean had more flexibility in the area between the two buildings but I know there's lots of different ways to look at it okay I guess I keep envisioning if we go a commercial kitchen we it's hard to hide it we don't have a big flat roof with parapets around it that we can hide it it's going to be really ugly no, you know, it's it just, I mean, putting it right on the street level or street side, or street or, or Beaver Street, it, it, like your Beaver becomes the alley. It's, you know, you, you drive down the alley and there's all the exhaust fans and the garbage cans and all that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, I just want to reiterate that you've um, you've hired some talented architects to help you come up with some really good solutions <laughs> to these problems. I myself, there's certainly things to think about, um, but we we have tools in our toolkit to, to make it look nice. Like Maya wants to come. You know, so I'm thinking about it. Part of the reason we're keeping the gym the way it is is because of the ceiling and how interesting that is so if we start doing um taking that away uh i think the whole point of keeping the building uh is hurt yeah you know i think again speaking to flexibility being 
the main concept of both of these structures, the more you start to encroach on the footprint of that space, you start to take away to some degree the versatility that that space could have. And also the, the like Robin was just saying, the aesthetics. The aesthetics. It, it's, it's the length, it's the arch, it's everything that you go ahead and you make it too small. Feel like you're in a melon. Yeah, so it, you know, thirty. Feet. It's thirty feet high at its apex. Yeah. Um, so to make that feel comfortable, mm -hmm. you something like that. It already feels really tall when you walk in as it is with that north mezzanine in there. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say if it's uncomfortably tall because the <laughs> the daylighting in there right now is so poor because you can't easily punch holes in the roof. I mean, they yeah. don't do that when they built it. It's pitch black in there. So as we start to mm -hmm. open it up a little bit, even just with temporary lighting and, and start to get a better feel for that space, then we can start to say, mm, you know what? It feels best if we only have, you know, 20 feet out away from the wall on one side built out. And then then it's like, and we have to balance that feeling of comfort with the functional aspect of the space. And can we maintain the versatility that people want in it. And another question is, which space do we prefer, the gym floor area or one of the classrooms? Because the classrooms still are a viable choice for a kitchen. Um, and actually, when you look at it, you could expand the uh, welcome center into that first classroom and still have room for the kitchen. So that's another option. I mean, there's absolutely there's again, that's why we hired you guys to give us all these options. And, there's there's a lot of, of logic in looking at putting the kitchen and the classroom built into us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. So what we do in the next phase is we start to have design shreds, not just amongst the design team, but with you all. And we start to put pen to paper and outlining all of these potential viable options. We don't walk away immediately with any one particular concept. You know, it's throwing spaghetti on a wall. And how does that <clears throat> spaghetti on the wall meet the functions identified in the programming report? It could be that we end up with five viable options that we then take out and present to the public and start to get feedback. Yeah, that's the fun part too. <laughs> fun part, yeah. So Maya's had her hand up. I don't know if she's. Oh, yeah. Maya, did you have a comment? I did. I think I just wanted to interject really quickly to kind of say that literally where we're what we're looking at at this point is our, our narrative thoughts in a graphic form. So these are just kind of, you know, fat markers on a paper right now just to understand what we've heard from people. But to go back to like that kitchen concept, we did think about putting the kitchen um, over in that kind of adjacent little bump out on the gym building, but and it's certainly an option. I think for us, what we were trying to think of is how do we phase you through this? And if you start with a smaller version kitchen, we don't want to pigeonhole you into not being able to expand it if you do decide to want a commercial kitchen down the road. So that's why we kind of pivoted at that point to talk about, well, if we put it here, we have an expansion opportunity. So we're trying to use our crystal ball for you <laughs> and figure out how can we get you incrementally towards this larger picture goal? Because it's all going to be, you know, funding, 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 and what can you afford, but still keeping the big picture in mind. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Very well put, Maya. Um, I had, uh, sorry, I had one question further down in the report. Um, I think it's R WDI. Yeah, RWDI. Uh, when they were assessing the envelope of the buildings, they're not really giving, I mean, they're not doing recommendations. They're just telling us what's there. And I, I totally get it. I couldn't quite understand whether the brick on the little bit of the south wall, the classrooms, and the west wall is adequate to stay or whether that is something that might need to be replaced. Did you catch that? Yeah. So the, the brick itself, is fine. It is constructed as a rain barrier system. So there's a, a air gap between the brick and the structure itself, which is very, very good. Okay. Brick itself is in good shape. The problem in thinking about do we keep it, do we replace it, is that 
as part of this whole thing, we have to think about that seismic update on that building. So having, it's a wood frame structure um, with CME masonry on the north and the east sides. Um, that does not lend itself very well to one full side of the building being windows, which is what we have on that side facing Beaver Street. So in order to rectify that, we do have to add some wall area in not insignificant widths. I think our engineer was saying a minimum of six feet in width where you would have what was once window now becomes wall from building foundation to roof. So when you start to look at that, that starts to take away some of that brick and you're left with, you know, maybe half of the brick that you had before. Actually, I was heading in a different direction. Um, if we have to take away the brick and wherever we have to take away the brick, can we, just to put a bug in here, save the brick and maybe use it somewhere in the patio? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to think of ways to um, keep the old history of the things that have to be taken out. Um, as far as the south wall to the classroom, the less window, the better. <laughs> That's a south wall and it is very obnoxious, especially if you're in a classroom situation. Um, they have, it's nice to be able to see out. I don't want to lose all the windows, but it's a, not the best design <laughs> for a classroom. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It, those spaces as they are have beautiful daylighting. I mean, just beautiful daylighting. But um, as we've talked about in our discussions with Travis, it's like the whole building is at its back turn to what people really want to see and be inspired by, and that's neck use and, and the estuary. Um, and that lends itself to if we were to do a corridor, an interior corridor, to be able to access each of these classrooms that we would probably recommend putting it on the south wall so you don't have that obnoxious self-facing windows that um, lend to glare, lend to, you know, you don't want to have that sort of visual disturbance when you're trying to learn, when you're trying to craft, um, and just keep the, the views really focused on the north, the estuary neck use. The other thing is when, when you put the dragonfly in there, we're gonna have to use a chainsaw to get it in there. <laughs> so yeah. oh, thinking about, <laughs> I didn't see a door that would accommodate. Yeah, I'm counting the door. So in the when we talk about adding windows and views on that north side of the building, we envision that probably being in the form of a storefront system, where then we can add a double door function to that. Um, I don't think we're talking about anything that would require an overhead door. Okay. Anything you can get in there. If you can't get it in a six foot opening, then that probably belongs in the gym for exhibition, right? Or it sits out on the. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe it's outdoor exhibition. You got it. I just since you mentioned it, thinking about it, the indoor corridor doesn't seem necessary to me. I'm totally happy with what the way it's always worked at the outdoor uh, cachet area. It needs upgrading, obviously, but it is a very comfortable space, even in the worst of weather. In, in looking at the examples for the classrooms and, and some other things and talking about storage, um, I think the, the, the city has some homework to do to say, what is the most likely combination of things that is going to be going on? For example, if we have enough chairs to operate the 2,000 square foot, um, well, then maybe if somebody wants to run something in the middle place at the same time, we, we can't, we can't accommodate that. So then we're only talking about uh, maybe 72 chairs or, or, or whatever, instead of 140 something. And um, what kind of events are likely to be in the rooms when they're not being used for classrooms, that kind of thing. Um, because we, we need to, and maybe it's research talking to other people, but um, we need to be realistic of how it's going to be used and make sure we accommodate those types of uses as opposed to just let's be ready for the you know the 9.3 or something. I, I strongly hope that the council can start talking about the uh, operations mm -hmm. and management yeah. 
while they're in this process yeah. so that we can have that back and forth. Yeah. That's a very important thing. We should schedule that soon yeah. because I totally agree. Storage is going to be an issue. Yeah. But I don't think that this facility is going to be maxed out in the beginning because these spaces don't exist anyplace else. And so it'll, I think it'll build over time, but um, we need to go ahead and try to predict that as much as we can. I'm a little concerned about the, and, and maybe we ought to have conversation with the, at least the major hotels to have ballroom space and hold, you know, dinners with what, what they have run into for small meeting spaces. Kind of request that they got what what's the market for that mm -hmm. and the other thing and maybe they they wouldn't know because they don't have those kind of spaces mm -hmm. but the other thing is i i i don't want this commercial kitchen threatening our hotels mm -hmm. and i i have a sense that they're going to see this as being competition Mm -hmm. to their ability to have large meetings, large events, because we now have added thousands of square feet and have put in a commercial kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that we as a city function want to be in the business of providing mm -hmm. full plate dinners rather than letting the hotels mm -hmm. and the restaurants cater those, those meals. So, and let's, I, I'm just not at all convinced that we need a commercial kitchen. Right. And if we're holding off decisions because we might need a commercial kitchen, we need to make that decision sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> anyway, I think that all gets to Sam's point that I'm to start thinking about how it will be run and then getting help from whoever that is. Say this is what we think we would need. We could go on and on and give you all kinds of new ideas. So uh, I'm afraid we will. I'm afraid they will. Uh, so I'm I guess I'm heading towards wrapping it up a little bit. Robin has her hand up. Robin. Did she have a comment or not? Yeah, I have a couple. <laughs> um one has to do with the Native American. Um I I didn't feel that the piece uh the community garden that was brought up, but to me, I felt there would be an equally valuable garden or setting for Native American plants. I don't know, maybe I've, um, I'm not aware that that didn't take a priority, but it's been one in my mind is that we could learn so much uh, from medicinal plants and different native plants here. So um, I didn't really see a focus of that. Yeah, great point. And I apologize for, for breezing over that. So we, the function of an executive summary is to try to efficiently summarize all the key points that you're bringing up in your report. And when we have something as flexible, both from a site program and a building program is what we have to try to really sum that up efficiently. I think we ended up with, you know, a six page report and I wouldn't be surprised if not all of you read that report because it's just, it's, it's, it's a lot to read and a lot to kind of take in. So some things we leave uh, as exhibits to be talked about in further detail. And one of that particular item, Robin, mm -hmm. is, is discussed uh, specifically in our landscape uh, architects exhibit. It's in there. And what her vision is, is rehabilitating the riparian area, which was that pink area in our site exhibit mm -hmm. that borders all the way from the east end to the west end of the site and across the north end with native plantings and potentially even doing placards that identify those plants that you're looking at that are native. Um, there are species out there that are non-native to that site that um, if they are not uh, invasive species like blackberries, which there is out there, 
<laughs> um, there is still interest by the stakeholders that we talk to to keep those, but maybe those aren't provided with that level of care uh, as far as the educational aspect of identifying those um, for the experiences, the, the people experiences in the nature of trail that runs along that riparian area. I guess I thought maybe they'd be more in a specific area than just along a trail, but maybe that isn't. Um... Well, Nate, yeah, and I think that's, that's part of a, a discussion and as we get into design a little bit is how do we want to learn about these native plantings and classic Nehalem traditional use of these plantings? Is it, as we just talked about with, like you would see um, in, a, in a nature conservatory where you have a plant in a particular location and a placard identifying that plant and its potential use is just right there where that specific plant is located, or do you have an exhibit in the welcome center or elsewhere on site exterior that goes through all of the plantings and then leave it to the, the person experiencing the site to go and find those individual specimens to know what they are. So we can, we'll start to have those conversations as we get into schematic design. And, uh, you know, as with, every aspect of this project to date, those decisions will not be made just by us, but you know, those will be talked about with all stakeholders who have interest in that particular um, piece, including well, that. And then the other item that I wanted to bring up had to do with the bridge. And um, have, having lived on the North End for what, 30 years? Um, I know that Les Shirley gets full no matter what. So if we're putting a lot of emphasis on having a bridge to have people park there and walk across the bridge, they can just walk around the, the way they always have if that's what they're doing. But most of the people um, at Les Shirley are having picnics and uh, family get togethers. And I just think that um, the bridge wasn't there when the Native Americans were there. And I think it's not, it's fluff. It's kind of like Disneyland. Um, Dick may disagree. And if he does, I respect that. But um, I just don't think it's necessary at all. Yeah, and that, you know, that raises a good point and a couple of good points, but the reason of us showing a potential footbridge that crosses the estuary, there's a couple of things The all of these individual pieces of city property, some are parks, some are just beach access. If they're connected in a meaningful way that people can experience on a bike or walking or jogging without you know, sharing pavement with cars and other vehicles, that there's a real potential there to open up this neck use as a as a asset to the community in a way that it can't be on its own. So I think, you know, the, the value of the part can be the sum of its parts and not just the individual piece. And that sum of its parts could be a simple, I say simple connection, the footbridge is not an example of a simple connection, but um, you do have all these pieces that are directly adjacent to each other that could function uh, more meaningfully, I think, as a whole. It is not in our scope of this current project to even be thinking about that stuff, but it's just impossible. You know, as architects, we're cursed with vision, right? And being able to see the potential in, in things. And that was kind of a low hanging fruit for us is if we had all the budget in the world, um, is this something that we see could be a real benefit to the community. Based on the stakeholders that we've talked to, it is. I think I'd also like to, on Robin's first question is, I think one of the reasons we did not talk or question Joyce's uh, landscape uh, comments is that they're all perfect, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the, the site layout, so there's no really question about that. It's it's the site. So um, and you followed the 
comments, I think, very well of all of the bajillion comments we got at the bottom of this. Um, no, I so in the fact that I, I couldn't find anything to question on where that was. I, I love the idea of the northwest corner being some sort of uh, combined outdoor event space. Uh, I'm dying to see how that comes out. Um, the uh, the purple zone is the connection to nature. So if that's where the natural plants go, um, that makes total sense. So uh, <clears throat> I know I'm, I'm. I guess that's where I'm just going. Is there, I guess yes. There is one little point. <laughs> the little grove behind the food pantry should have had its own color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. So we identify that as a significant grove that gives a unique experience to the site. And it's a it's a spruce grove and it's um, quite mature. Uh, we've incorporated it with, you know, the rest of the purple zone is a riparian area, but right, it, it deserves its own. It stands out as a landscape feature on that site. I don't know it well enough to know how if there's a, a different aspect of riparian activity localized to that particular grove that maybe isn't present on in other aspects, you know, of that riparian area. And if so, maybe it leads lends itself into a unique function for that space. Right. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Okay. I'm <clears throat> sure that we've been talking to Doug Doerr. And he has sent us a proposal for what we what he's calling a phase one um, look at the site, and he's calling it a shovel study, where they do down to a certain depth and in maybe ten yards between you know every one of them just to see if there's anything to come back and focus on more. But I'm I'm hearing that we might be having to do some uh, foundation work like within the, uh, especially in the gym, if we're gonna be doing lifts and things like that. So I'm gonna ask them, and I don't know what the effectiveness is of, of you know, the ground penetrating radar or whatever, but um, that's a case where we may wanna know more about uh, what's under there before we get in and start talking about designs for things that we wanna do and put in that are gonna to, going to require some structural work. Yeah, uh, at least. Let's talk to our, have him talk to the PSU architectural guy, our archaeological folks, right? Because they have methodologies. That they well, no, yeah, I know. I'm saying, but it, the proposal they gave us was mostly outside, around, and then not including anything that's underneath the uh, paved area or anything inside the buildings. I'm just thinking that we probably we might want to expand that scope, and I'll talk more with Steve about it. But um, that's the area that I'm more concerned about having significant um, disturbances. Let's see what the structural engineering says about might have to do to shore up you know, the structure before we spend the money doing ground penetrating radar in and facing to the building. I've, I've heard different kind of reports. Everything looks good or some modest additional work Let's find out just what needs to be done, the foundations. And then I think we can make a decision. Certainly we'd have to, I think we'd have to do uh, an investigation of the ground that would be disturbed if it's determined that we need to do some structural work, either penetrating through the floor inside the building or, or maybe the outside. Yeah. I just can't see anything like we're talking about being able to stand on that slab. But I think you're also got a chicken or the egg question here. Do you look at it, the ground first, or do you figure out what you might want to put there first? And I think they're going to give us a bunch of ideas of where things might go. And at that point, we then could say, this is a spot that we need to double check and make sure it works. And I also, a uh, utility lift is not an elevator. It's a utility lift. That's right. It's not necessarily a uh, 
ground, it doesn't need a major foundation. It's going to carry as much weight as it was, was carrying people. You can put a car lift in a normal garage. It, and there are different lifting mechanisms. Uh, we talked about whether they're hydraulic, you know, which would require um, ex excavation as opposed to other types of lifts that are not hydraulic, that don't require a centralized piston that telescopes into the ground, right? That would probably be something that we would levitate towards so as not to have to disturb ground that we don't have to disturb. Hey, that's what we pay you the big bucks for. <laughs> hey, any other comments, questions? <laughs> yeah, good job, folks. Write that down, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick question. Please. Um, and I, I missed the part of the discussion about covered areas on the patio. Was it discussed to have them temporary ones that were put up and taken down or permanent ones? We mentioned them in the program report as either or. There's benefits to both. Um, during the pandemic, we've we've <laughs> we went from having maybe one outdoor pavilion request from a client in the last ten years to three inside of a week because people want to be able to gather safely outdoors under cover, even if it's raining. Um, and so we've we've seen a lot of interest in people gravitating towards these permanent outdoor pavilions. I see that as maybe a killing two birds with one stone in that we could also incorporate a meaningful solar system that can be experienced, really experienced and made part of uh, the, the how somebody sees the site and values the site and experiences the site. Um, but it can also be temporary and, you know, with non-permanent dead man anchors. It could be something as simple as actually the across the street here from City Hall, where they hold wedding venues across here and they have a, a tent that I assume gets taken down every once in a while and put back up, but it could be something as simple as that. And, and where I'm coming from on that is that I think having an outside covered area there is a great idea, but if, it's, if it doesn't have light, natural light, the temperature drops 20 degrees. I mean, and the wind comes through there. And so I, I think it's important to have some nat natural light and, and not cover it with um, solar panels. Okay. You can have skylights go in the covered area too. I think that's also part of our management discussion. What are we thinking as far as outdoor usage? Or the patio area, and uh, how might that? And it's evolution also, because it's temporary. We can always add to it and take it away. So yeah, I, I, good question though, because I was curious how might that look. Uh, so great consideration. Okay then, thank you for your presentations and all the comments and questions and then keep them coming. So council is approving the program as presented. And they are can move forward with schematic design. Yes. Maybe we should have applauded too. <laughs> <laughs> um if you all do that, I'll applaud. <laughs> no, I yes. think that they're they're Keep going. Go on with what you're doing. Um, the next ones might be a little more sticky. We'll see. That be print depends on what you sell. Now, as we start putting pen to paper and really defining what these spaces are, we fully expect, you know, we start picking things apart at that point and it starts to trigger ideas, right, from everyone. Um, so we're, we're expecting a lot of lengthy discussions in the coming schematic design. Okay. We're all accessible. You can, if you need a meeting with us, you give a call and then we'll figure out something. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, good of the order for the council. Uh, we'll we meet uh, again next with the uh, architects.
Why don't we let them get started first? <laughs> we have a fine. I just didn't know whether it was a programmed meeting or not. There's a tentative schedule, but I, we probably need to make sure it's updated. Yeah. But we'll get back with you on the meeting dates. It's a good point. Yeah, there is a schedule in the programming document, but I think as we start to begin the schematic design, I think we need to take a look at that and yeah. make sure a milestone date still makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, hearing anything else, we are adjourned. All right. Thanks. Thank you.